Hi everyone, okay. Uh, this is uh, long promised 8.2 qualitative analysis of salts. You'll see you're having problem with the second part of um, chapter 8 salts, right? So I'm going to do this uh, with you all. I have done it before, but uh, had some problems. So we'll do it again, right? Okay, so let's see um, 8.2 qualitative analysis of salts. Uh, it's a chapter that is not to say difficult. However, uh, it requires quite a bit of memorizing, right? And that is where the challenge comes from. Uh, so pay close attention, try to understand, wherever we can understand things, we will do it based on understanding and refrain just from purely memorizing because that's the weakest way to move forward, okay? All right, so we'll try to keep understanding at the maximum for this. Let's go to the beginning part, okay? The meaning of qualitative analysis, right? So guys, um, just in case you'll have forgotten, 8.1 of this chapter was all about the solubility of salts and then uh, you would have also learned how to calculate uh, if you had this much salt, if you had this much uh, reactant, uh, how much salt would be produced, and so on and so forth. So all that falls un under the quantitative analysis of salts, right? So all that is basically we are dealing with quantities of the salt. Um, whereas now for 8.2, it's more based on the qualitative aspects of salt, right? So what are the qualities uh, that these salts possess, how we can use these qualities to test the different salts, how we can use these qualities to identify mainly, right? So this chapter is mainly, uh, this part is mainly about identifying the salts, right? And all salts are made up of a cation and an anion, and uh, we can actually test. We need to do separate tests and identify the cation. Then you identify the anion, and ta-da, you will have the salt that we are talking about, right? So that is basically the skill set that you are driven by your syllabus um, to to, to uh, you know, uh, get the knowledge for, right? And so that is what uh, our goal, right? Our objective of this area is going to be, right? So let's start off with number one. Qualitative analysis is a chemical technique used to determine the identities of chemical substances present in a mixture, but nothing to do with their quantities. The quantities we did it earlier. Mainly your quantities, quantitative analysis is all what you did in Form 4, Chapter 3, right? A mixture of that and a little bit of a higher level thinking and that was 8.1 right so it's all your your normal number of moles and you know volume of gas and a number of particles and all that is covered in 8.1 it's kind of a recap of your form 4 chapter 3 just that um, you're looking at it from the point of view of salts and the formation of salts okay whether soluble or insoluble right okay let's go to number two, okay? <clears throat> so qualitative analysis of a salt is a scheme, okay? That means a set of rules uh, of tests carried out to identify the cation and anion present in a salt. The techniques we can use is A, observe the color of the salt when it is mixed in an aqueous solution. B, you could observe the solubility of the salt in water. If it is soluble, you know it could be this, this, this salt. If it's insoluble, then it could be, you know, other salts, right? We'll be going through all this one by one after this. C, uh, we can see the effect of heat on the salt. D, we can identify what gas is given off, right, when you do a particular test on that salt. So you mix that salt with something and then it re releases maybe carbon dioxide gas. So we know, oh, that is a carbonate salt. So you've identified the anion. The anion is carbonate, like that. That's just an example. Then we can move on. Um, we could identify the precipitate formed when a specific chemical reagent is added to the aqueous salt solution. That's towards the end of the chapter. So you add a reagent, a particular chemical that we've chosen uh, to test, right? What is the cation or anion present? And from there, if you get a positive test, you know, yes, that cation is present or anion. And if it's a negative test, then you have to use another reagent because clearly the, the cation or anion that we thought is there is not there. Then we can move on to number to, to F, sorry, where we'll be carrying out confirmatory tests, uh, which are specific chemical tests to confirm the identity of a cation or anion in a salt. So guys, all these are from A to E are all merely you are just, um, you know, narrowing down. We're normally narrowing down. Oh, it's not this anion. It's not that cation. It's this, it's that, it's that. Okay, we're narrowing it down, the possibilities. And once you've narrowed it down, right, then only we'll carry out what they said in 3F which is known as confirmatory test. Confirmatory test, the final test that tells you we are not narrowing it down. We're telling you exactly this is the cation or this is the anion that is actually present within that salt solution. Okay, so uh, that's just the basic introduction that we are carrying out here, right? 
uh, now we can go, we will start with uh, the first one as you can see here, right, 3A, observing, so we'll do analysis based on, the first one is observing the colour of the salt, okay, when it's in an aqueous solution, so like I said, we'll be doing each one of it in detail, right, so look at number one here, initial observation of the physical properties of a salt, such as colour and solubility in water, will enable us to make inferences regarding the possible cations and anions present, see, huh? they said inference, Inference means is a narrowing down. They didn't say a conclusion. A conclusion would be a confirmatory test where you know exactly which anions or cations are present. Huh? Present. So basically, when you look at colors and solubility of salts, we are only narrowing it down. There is no confirmatory test here. Okay. Um, so that's why they say this part. However, the presence of the cations or anions needs to be confirmed by other tests, right? And eventually, it will be a confirmatory test. Number two. Most of the salts are white in colour and when dissolved in water will form colourless aqueous solutions, right? So telling you, when at the end of the day, right, you look at most salts, they are always going to be white colour powder, right? In fact, you look at sodium chloride, our table salt that we put in our food, even that is white colour. So most salts are like that, they look exactly like sodium chloride, you won't be able to differentiate them much, right? Uh, and the moment you mix it with water, it is a colourless solution. Same with sodium chloride, our table salt, you mix it with water and ta-da! What happens it becomes it looks just like water right it's totally colorless solution so this applies to most of the salts that we are uh that the most of the salts right for, that you can get from the cations and anions from your periodic table most of them are colorless in uh, liquid and white in solid form however number three would state that cations of transition elements have specific colors so if it's a transition element then now they have different colors and the colors uh, might vary, right, okay, when it's in solid form and when it's in solution form, right, so we will go to this, uh, we will uh, uh, go further in, and delve into this, right, uh, to see, okay, what are the colours in solid and solution form for different cations, okay, and anions, okay, so, <clears throat> let's start, okay, so, first, white and colourless, okay, white and colourless, uh, you would find in solid form, it'll be sodium, potassium, ammonium, magnesium, calcium, barium, aluminium, lead, and zinc, okay? This uh, is the color of the solid that will form, huh? right? Either white, uh, most of the time white huh, in this case, uh, if the anions are colorless, right? So that means if it depends on their color, well, in solid form, they are mostly white, okay? In solution form, they mostly form colorless solutions here. So you see in solution form, it'll be uh, sodium, potassium, ammonium, magnesium, calcium, barium, aluminium, lead, and zinc. They form colorless solutions. Okay, so uh, that is basically what we're talking about. Now we can move on, okay, uh, to yellow, right? So what is yellow? What solid is yellow, right? So lead oxide is a yellow color solid. Lead iodide, right, uh, is a yellow color solid. Lead chromate, is a yellow color solid. Even barium chromate is yellow color solid, right? Okay, so uh, basically these uh, are the substances, right? Solid substances that are yellow in color, okay? Solution-wise, iron-3, if it's um, if it's a dilute solution, uh, then iron-3 could be yellow color. Chromate, uh, dichromate ion also are yellow color. Then we can go to blue color, okay? Hydrated copper 2 ions, uh, salt solution in solid form is blue color, even in solution form will be blue color, right? So copper 2 is rather easy. Green color, iron 2, copper carbonate and copper chloride, okay? Uh, so this ion and those substances, uh, they are all green color in solid form, right? In solution form, only iron 2 presents itself in a green color solution, okay? If, if, if the salt has iron 2 ions. Then for black color, then uh, that's simple, copper 2 and iron 2 oxide or copper 2 and iron 2 sulfide these are always black color solids right the most important is copper oxide you must know is a black color solid right and uh, the in solution form right uh, they don't really form uh, normal solutions uh, you see in these cases right so we do not have a confirmatory color for them okay then when it comes to uh, brown or orange color right iron 3 salts right Hydrated iron 3 salts, that means a dot H2O at the back, right? So any hydrated iron 3 salt would always be brown or orange in color. That is why rust is also brown in color, right? In solution form, again, iron 3 uh, and uh, dichromate 7 
right? These are all um, brown or orange in color. Okay, all right. All right, let's move on to number five. Okay, table eight point one zero. So, so guys, this is basically. Uh, let's before I go on, right? Okay, so here basically you have the colors, right? So you roughly must know, right? The diff different colors of the solutions, right? And the solids, right? These are important. You kind of need to memorize. That's why I said not hard, however, very uh, intensive in terms of memorizing, right? This this area of the chapter is very intense in memorizing. So you roughly must know exactly the colors of all these, right? So they have more some, some that are more famous than others. They come out more often than others. As you do questions, you will be able to identify them. Okay, and I'll also explain to you later. And you'll know which is the ones that you should actually be paying more attention to. Okay, but generally, an understanding of this is important, right? The color of the solid and solutions of the uh, ions that we are talking about. Okay, all right. Let's go. So, so that is one way. Huh? So, so, so what we are saying is like, for instance, uh, you have a solution, okay? And that solution is yellow in color, right? So you could say that, hey, there's a possibility uh, it's a iron-3 ion. There's an iron-3 ion present here. You could say, right? Again, that, that is one of the reasons. Or if it's blue color solution, then we say, oh, there's a high chance that there's a copper-2 ion present in the solution. So you see, we are narrowing down, right? So that's why you need to know that. Let's go to number five. Table 8.10 shows the solubility of different types of salts in water. So in this case, uh, you want to identify the cation or anions, right? Based on the solubility of the salt, okay? And uh, this part is an overlap of what you learned in 8.1. 8.1 at the beginning of this chapter would have been 8.1, where they would have uh, made you memorize the different salts and the solubility. So, uh, now we're just doing a slight recap on that, which is kind of good since we didn't do 8.1, uh, right? So you all said you all only had problem from 8.2 onwards, right? So, okay. So basically, uh, you all should know this. All salts of sodium, potassium, and ammonium are soluble, okay? All salts of sodium, potassium, ammonium are soluble. That is spa, sodium, potassium, ammonium. All nitrate salts are soluble. So basically, we can say span, right? Okay. All nitrate salts are Soluble. So why did they separate sodium, potassium, uh, ammonium from nitrate? Because sodium, sodium, potassium, ammonium are positive ions, they're cations, whereas nitrate is a negative ion, right? So span, all span salts are soluble, sodium, potassium, ammonium, and nitrate. Then we can come to sulfate. All sulfates are soluble, okay, except barium, uh, lead, and calcium sulfate, which we say what? Per satuan bangsa china. I'm not trying to be racist, right? Just a way to memorize it. You all can memorize it how you want, right? So, uh, lead, barium, and calcium. So, per satu and bang china, every, so for sulfate, everything uh, is soluble except these three. Lead, barium, calcium. They are insoluble sulfates, right? Then we can go to chloride salts. Okay, chloride salts, okay, uh, are soluble. All chloride salts are soluble just like sulfate except what? Per satuan agama Hindu. That means what? Lead. Okay. What's this? Sorry. Huh? Lead, right? Uh, silver, which is argentum. And mercury, which is HG, right? So it's per satuan agama Hindu, right? Okay. So basically, uh, that is all. Right? Okay. So uh, all chlorides are soluble salts except lead chloride, argentum chloride, which is silver chloride, and uh, mercury Chloride, okay? Let's move on with that. I'll take that off. Okay, now we come here. <clears throat> okay? For sulfate and chloride, all were soluble except, like we said, Prasatuan Bangsa China, Prasatuan Agam Hindu. But for carbonate, however, it's the other way around. All carbonates are insoluble except the three soluble cations, which is sodium, Potassium, ammonium, spa. Okay, so everything's insoluble except sodium, potassium, and ammonium. For oxides, all oxides are insoluble except, again, sodium, potassium, in this case, sodium, potassium, and calcium. So SPCA, right? Okay, if you love animals and pets, then you could use that, right? Okay, so uh, sodium, potassium, and calcium. The other two, uh, generally, this I don't really have a method to memorize them, but we can just go through. Uh, for instance, hydroxides, all are insoluble except what? Uh, potassium, sodium, calcium, and barium hydroxides. All the others, 
okay, are insoluble except these four. Potassium, sodium, calcium, barium, hydroxide are actually soluble. Lead halides, right? That means any lead mixed with the group 17 anion. Eh? So all lead halide, sorry, are insoluble in cold water. None of them dissolve in cold water, but heat the water up and they become soluble. So they are insoluble in cold water, but they are soluble in hot water. All right. So there we go. Okay, just take all these off. Okay, right? Now, guys, <clears throat> we are done with that one small section, okay? So uh, that is the easiest part, right? There's a lot of things to memorize, but it's not difficult to know what is going on, right? Okay, so now we move on to the test of gases, okay? Make very clear what's the test of gases, huh? All right, so... So this is the second, uh, this is actually the third thing. Uh, the first was we looked at the color of the salts, right? In solid or in solution form. So if you look at it, then you can identify that maybe it's this ion, maybe it's that ion, right? And then we came to the solubility in water. And then you can also, there it's all for narrowing down. Huh? So you can narrow down to more anions, cations, right? Then now we're coming for gases, the second, uh, third thing that we were learning about when we did number three earlier. So here we're test, uh, doing a test of gases, right? And we're going to see based on the gases released, what is the possible cations or anions present in that particular substance, right? So let's go for test of gases number one. There are three ways to test gases that are evolved. First of all, you need to know gases are evolved either when it is heated, when a substance is heated, a substance is reacted with dilute or concentrated acid, it is basically reacted with an acid, huh? right? And C, when it's heated up, but this time with an alkali. So the earlier heating is just heating up on its own. That means we want it to decompose. You take a substance, you heat it up and it decomposes, right? So we just take a substance and I heat it up and then it releases gas, okay? So that was number one, right? Number two, you take the substance, okay? Uh, you take the substance and you just mix it with an acid, right? So basically you take the substance, you add an acid and when you add the acid, it releases gas, okay? So that is the one, right? Third one, Okay, you take the substance, right? Now you add in alkali and then you heat it up and then now it releases a gas. So, okay, so these are three ways you can test uh, what, uh, these are the three ways you can cause a substance to release gas, right? So you have a substance and you want to know what is the cation or anion present. You want to do it in terms of gases that are released. So what we do, you either heat it up, you mix it with an acid or you heat it after mixing it with an alkali. Either three ways is going to give you gases release and then we will do tests on these gases release and based on that test we will know what other cations or anions present okay in these solutions all right okay so that's that let's continue number two Based on the gas evolved, information about the type of ions present can be deduced. For instance, if carbon dioxide gas is evolved uh, in a reaction, carbonate ions are present in that salt. So simple. Let's say we did uh, number one, right? I took a substance. We're doing A, huh? just heating it up. Took a substance. I heated it up. It gave off carbon dioxide. From carbon dioxide, I already know the anion is carbo. Neat. So this is what we're going to learn now, right? We're going to learn that, oh, if carbon dioxide is given off, it's carbonate ion. See? So that is one way we can do it, right? So just an example, right? Same way, you mix any uh, substance with acid or you heat it up after mixing it with an alkali and it still gives off carbon dioxide gas, then yeah, right? Okay, then basically, again, you could con come to that conclusion that carbonate ions, anion is present, okay? So let's go. Uh, they, in table 8.11, we have a summary, right, of... Uh, the different properties and tests on different uh, gases, physical properties and tests on different gases. We'll start off with the first one, which is oxygen. Okay, basically all this we know. Huh? Uh, basically, it's quite simple: oxygen and hydrogen. Okay, both have no color; they're colorless. Both have no smell. Both has no effect on litmus paper. In other words, they are both neutral. A red litmus paper stays red. A blue litmus paper stays. Blue, so they're totally neutral gases, okay? But they do have a confirmatory test. For instance, oxygen, you can put a glowing wooden splinter, you learn this in form one actually. You put a glowing wooden splinter into oxygen gas, 
right? And what happens? It will rekindle the glowing wooden splinter, or we'll say the re uh, the, the uh, splinter uh, lights up again, right? Okay, so uh, we normally use the term rekindle. That would be more scientific. So there we go, right? Okay, so oxygen. If there's oxygen, it will rekindle a glowing wooden splinter. If you take the splinter and you put it inside that gas, okay? And if it's oxygen, it rekindles. Hydrogen, however, you take a lighted splinter, the same splinter, but not when it's glowing. You light it up, make sure there's a flame, and then you put it in the presence. If it is hydrogen gas, you put it in its presence, and the lighted wooden splinter, right, uh, would, uh, would, would uh, generate a pop sound. That is literally a ex small explosion because hydrogen is a reactive gas. So when it reacts with a flame, right, it gives off a small explosion, a pop sound. Now guys, that's because you put it at the mouth of the test tube and it gave a pop pop sound, okay? Imagine if a whole room is full of hydrogen gas, then the last thing you want to do is take a lighted wooden splinter to test for hydrogen gas because that pop sound will be much louder like a bam, right, and we could die. So Okay, there will be a much bigger explosion. So this is only for when hydrogen gas is being released from test tubes. That's when we test with a lighted wooden splinter. At other times, if there's more hydrogen gas involved and you want to test for it, please be very careful, okay? Further deliberation would be needed. You need to think about it a bit more, okay? All right, so anyway, for your syllabus, we're always assuming uh, we're testing it at the mouth of a test tube, okay? Next, if it's carbon dioxide gas release, let's say a gas is released, okay, and you realize it's... Um, Carbon dioxide, uh, you want to know whether it's carbon dioxide gas, right? So if carbon dioxide gas is released, there is one way you can test for it, okay? You can test for it uh, by just bubbling it into lime water. Again, you would have learned this in Form 1, right? You bubble it into lime water, lime water turns cloudy, milky, chalky, whichever term you want to use, right? And when if the lime water does become cloudy, milky, chalky, then yes, carbon dioxide gas is present. So this is, now we're just learning that, okay? But also you need to know, carbon dioxide gas is colorless, it does not have any smell, just like oxygen and hydrogen. However, it does turn moist blue litmus paper to red, because it is not very acidic, however, slightly acidic, okay? Because when mixed with water, uh, it actually produces carbonic acid. So we will see, uh, I mean, we won't see that later actually. But yeah, anyway, so this is basically it, huh? right? Okay, carbon dioxide is slightly acidic, right? Then we can go to ammonia gas, okay? Ammonia gas is colorless, however, a very pungent smell. It produces a very pungent smell. It uh, is the only gas in your syllabus which is alkali. So it's very easy to memorize, huh? right? Ammonia gas uh, is the only alkali gas you will be learning about. Hence, it turns moist red litmus paper to blue color. It has a very pungent, not a very nice smell, right? And then how do we test for ammonia gas. If you believe that a gas coming out from a substance is ammonia gas, you need to take a glass rod separately, dip that glass rod, okay, dip that glass rod into concentrated hydrochloric acid, concentrated HCl. Now you take it and you put it right near the mouth of the test tube with ammonia. So let's simply do this. Huh? We have a test tube, right, and there you go. And we believe this gas coming out is ammonia. So what I do, I have a beaker with HCl. I take a glass rod. This is a glass rod. I dip it inside hyd uh, concentrated hydro hydrochloric acid. Then I take that glass rod, the tip, right? This tip is dipped in hydrochloric acid and I put it above the, the, the test tube which I believe ammonia gas is coming out but I need to try to confirm it. So when the ammonia gas does react with the concentrated hydrochloric acid, it will give off a white color fume. It's a white fume. Okay? It's like smoke, right? But it's totally white, powdery white in color, right? So that white fumes will be given off, right? Okay, so basically, how do we test for ammonia gas? Well, with concentrated hydrochloric acid. Okay? And you need to get white fumes. Okay? So that is that. All right, now we move on uh, to chlorine. But actually, no, before we go to chlorine, it is more logical. Shall we go to hydrogen chloride first? Okay, how do we test for hydrogen chloride gas? So if to test for ammonia, we use HCl, then obviously to test for HCl, you would use what? Ammonia, the exact same test, guys. You take the glass rod, because now you believe that it's um, hydrogen chloride coming out of a particular test tube uh, mouth, right? So you now test it with ammonia. So you take a glass rod, dip it in ammonia solution, take the tip, 
put it in the front of the test, uh, the mouth of the test tube, and then it's going to release the same white fumes. And if that is the case, then you know that is hydrogen chloride. Okay, so basically ammonia and HCl they test each other. Okay, both will produce white fumes. It's literally the same reactants that are mixing. All right. Okay, so basically that is it. They're the test for each other. Okay. All right. Uh, however, hydrogen. If uh, yeah, if ammonia was um, alkaline in nature, then hydrogen chloride. You need to know is of course uh, acidic in nature. In fact, hydrogen chloride mixed with water is hydrochloric acid. So there we go. Right. So uh, it of course will change moist blue litmus paper to red. But both ammonia and hydrogen chloride give a pungent smell. All right. So we are done with ammonia and hydrogen chloride. Now we'll go to the guy in the middle there. I don't know why they didn't put ammonia and hydrogen chloride together. However, so now we go to chlorine. Huh? Chlorine, however, is not a colorless gas. For the first time, we're having not a colorless gas here. And uh, it is even choking in nature. That means if you try to smell it, okay, you will start to cough and choke, right? It, is a, it gives a very choking smell. Uh, and uh, it is, of course, acidic, right? Because you know all non-metals in your period periodic table are acidic in nature. So it will decolorize moist, moist red... Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, it is acidic in nature, chlorine, huh? but in this case, uh, don't forget that even uh, all your group 17 uh, substances are also what? They are bleaching agents. So in this, guy, in this case, it will decolorize uh, your moist blue or red litmus paper. Okay, But if you use any other, if, not, if you don't use a litmus paper, use a universal indicator or anything else, well then you will find out that chlorine is a slightly acidic gas in nature. In fact, they used chlorine gas in World War I uh, to actually eat up people's lungs, uh, the inner linings of the lungs. It was a horrific, horrific death, okay, the person would face. Okay, so now we can move on to sulfur dioxide, guys, right? So sulfur dioxide, what is its characteristics? It's a colorless gas. It gives a pungent uh, smell, okay? Uh, it changes moist blue litmus paper to red because it is slightly acidic. How do we know? Well, take sulfur dioxide and mix it with water, and what will you get? You will get sulfuric acid. So clearly, sulfur dioxide will be an acidic gas, right? Um, <clears throat> what is our confirmatory test for it? Very simple. It is, uh, you can use an oxidizing agent. So you can either take sulfur dioxide gas and bubble it into acidified potassium manganate 7 solution and uh, it'll, uh, oxi uh, it will um, oxidize, right? Okay, and you will change purple to colorless, right? So acidified potassium manganate 7 uh, solution is purple color and it will become colorless. If you take sulfur dioxide and put it in another oxidizing agent, which is acidified potassium dichromate 6 solution, then now it will change from orange to green. So you can test it with both these oxidizing agents. That is actually an official confirmatory test for the gas sulfur dioxide. So once you prove sulfur dioxide is present, then, you know, we can prove where the sulfate ions and so forth are present in the solution. Okay, all right, but that's later. Now we're just trying to know what is the test we can do on the different gases? How to identify, oh, this is the gas being released. That is the gas being released, right? So right now we're just doing the tests on the gases, okay? Then we can go to the last gas, right? Which is nitrogen dioxide. Nitrogen dioxide, guys, is a brown color gas. So there you go, right? It's brown color. Uh, so chlorine is yellowish green. Nitrogen dioxide is brown color. Everything else is colorless. Uh, it is pungent, however, right? A very strong smell you get from it. Uh, it uh, is obviously uh, slightly acidic, so it changes blue litmus paper to red. Uh, and what? How do? How can you prove that? Well, nitrogen dioxide, if you bubble it into water, and it, it will produce an acid known as nitric acid. And so, yes, obviously, it's going to be acidic in nature. However, there is no confirmatory test for nitrogen dioxide, right? Same, uh, same. Even chlorine uh, doesn't have a confirmatory test, right? But however, if it bleaches the the, the, the litmus paper, then you could come to say that there is a chance, right? That uh, there's a higher chance that it is definitely chlorine, but it's still not a confirmatory test. Confirmatory test we will do later, okay? So that is basically it. This part, we just wanted to know what is the properties of gases, all the gases, right? And that's what we did from here. Sorry, yeah. From here. What am I doing? Sorry, guys. Small mistake with the pen. Okay, so from here, to here, we were learning the physical properties of every gas, and then from here to here, we want to know what is the confirmatory test to know what gas, to confirm that yes, it is the gas that we are suspecting it is, okay? So, just the basics, right, that we are covering right now, okay? So, that is that for now.
Okay, and then I will probably uh, I'm I'm rushing, so I've been <clears throat> I'm going to be doing the videos in segments and posting it up. Please bear with me, guys. I know you have to now go out of one video and go into the next. I'm sorry because I'm doing it at different times. Uh, so just bear with me. But uh, okay, so that's the beginning part of 8.2. We will I'll continue on my next video with uh, heating test on salts just a bit later. Okay, right? Thank you, guys. See you all in the next video.